always a pleasure to get this bloke on. We haven't spoken to him for a couple of weeks because we've been away at the Rugby World Cup while you've been doing the Cricket World Cup. Simon Dool, welcome back. Thanks, Marty. How are you, mate? Bloody well, actually. I can hear the clink of glasses, cutlery, food being prepared and put on plates. That means you're in the lounge at whatever airport you're at. I have made it to the lounge in Mumbai. Yes, off to uh, Bangalore for tomorrow's crucial encounter, I guess, now that uh, New Zealand have still had the opportunity to get through to the semi-finals. Yeah. And um, and so how long does that flight take? I mean, put us in ge- geographic perspective on India for us. Um, yeah, so this one's not too bad, about an hour and 20 minutes. Um, the longest one we've sort of taken would be Chennai to Durham Shala, this, uh, this tournament, about four and a half hours. Uh, in total with a stop, um, most of them you're talking within an hour and a half to two hours. So it's not all bad, but um, as you know, a very vast country. Um, talking to Smithy the other day, he hasn't been here for 20 odd years and things, you know, I kind of get used to how good um, things are nowadays with airports and travel and stuff. It's a lot different compared to when we first came here in the early 90s and he was blown away. He's just absolutely blown away by how... Um, simple things are compared to when he was last year. Oh, so cool. Look, tell us, tell us, a, tell a, us a little, yeah, tell us a little bit about that then. Like, I mean, how much of a nightmare could it have possibly been, and was it? Well, it, it was just very tough. I mean, the, the ease of getting through security and airports and things like that just used to take, like, a two-hour flight would be a, a day's travel. By the time you left your hotel at maybe eight o'clock in the morning, you would probably reach your hotel at 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon. So a two-hour flight would end up being a day's travel with all of the traffic, with the problems at the airports, with the security issues, you know, all of that sort of stuff, and then getting to the other end in another hour and a half stuck in traffic. So the ease of which things move nowadays compared to how they used to is drastically changed. The quality of the airports, um, the company that owns uh, the Delhi capital site actually GMR they build most of the brand new airports in the country now and they are phenomenal they, you know all of the mod cons I've just picked up a, a Starbucks coffee Marty I, you can't get a decent coffee in, in this country I mean it's very difficult but um, Starbucks at least you know what you're getting I suppose that's, yeah, that's one same. of the things same. Um, but yeah they're all in, you know, they're all in all the airports, and the airports are magnificent now. See, look, same in France, mate. And the, the first thing I did when I came back to New Zealand, and I mean, what a coffee wanker I am, but the first thing I did actually was run and get a decent coffee because in the whole of France, mate, they can't make a decent coffee. And in the end, you go to those big brand places, you go to your Starbucks and things, and you get sneered at by your fellow New Zealanders. Yeah. What are you drinking that for? Well, at least I know it's consistent. It's a big cup of soapy, milky coffee, but at least it tastes like a coffee. Absolutely. A hundred percent, you know, it, it's bizarre and we do, we do get that way and I get that way in London as well now and yeah. even in Dubai there's some great coffee shops but Black, Black Sheep is the, is the place to go in, in London if you're there, good Kiwi company um, called Black Sheep make magnificent coffee. They had a bar in Paris called that as well, they had another one called Eden Park, I went to all of those kind of bars. Anyway, so we Ooh. left to go to the Rugby World Cup and the Cricket World Cup was just starting. The Rugby World Cup seemed to go forever, <laughs> we've come back and it's still going. But it's been magnificent mate and I've just been addicted to it since I came back. I got it. You've got to forgive me, while we were at the Rugby World Cup we were just so enveloped in that, I didn't really, look I was looking at results but I didn't spend any time you know, even trying. I, I, I went to one pub and watched I think Australia were on the screen for half an hour and then they swapped it to the football. But let's talk first and foremost about last night and the big show, Glenn Maxwell. And Simon, when you go through those stats, and I'll repeat them again for people, they're just insane. He hit 148 in boundaries of 31 deliveries, 201 not out, and at the other end, Cummings, 12 off 68. It's just brilliant, isn't it? I mean, we have been privileged to some phenomenal one-day innings at different times. I mean, Martin Guptill's 237. I, I'm old enough to remember Viv Richards' uh, 187. Uh, uh, you know, A.B. de Villiers scoring 100 off 40-something balls. I don't think I've seen a better, a better 50-over innings in my life. And, the, you know, you couple with the fact that he's obviously cramped up, they are seven wickets down. He's got a bloke at the other end who's 12, you know, double 68 balls. He can't run. The clean hitting and the, the power that he possesses and showed on last night was just exceptional. And the clarity of mind to just be able to do that. I know he had chances. I know there were opportunities. But, man, you, you go a long way to see a better under pressure. All of those big scores I've talked about in general terms uh, have been um, setting totals, not chasing totals, not under pressure. All of the big hundreds in this tournament 
generally have been in setting circumstances, not in chasing circumstances. So, you know, that adds pressure to it. It was just unbelievable. I, I, I'm still a bit staggered as to what I've seen, and I think we'll be talking about this for a long, long time. Yeah, great stats there. He is, of the 11, he's the only one that was in a chasing side. He's also the only one that wasn't an opening batsman. So, you know, and you think about all of the great number threes and fours that have come in and for him to do that. So, I mean, in the end, though, mate, I mean, was the bowling just inadequate? Because the guy was cramped up. I mean, we watched the highlights today. He could hardly move. He was swinging it like a baseball bat. Yeah, and, and every time he went down with cramp, and he did it often, uh, I could not believe that one of the Bangladesh, uh, sorry, one of the Afghanistan support staff were not out there talking to their bowlers saying, we have to take it slow and we have to take it wide of off stump. We've got to bowl in, just inside that tram line and make them reach for it. They went into body, they bowled at his body time and time again, and he just bashed it out of the park. So there was some really poor options for a team that has been quite clinical throughout the early parts of the tournament. They, they, they just fell last, they faltered last night and they succumbed to pressure. They stopped trying to win the game and you know what this is like, Marty, whether it be football, whether it be okay, rugby, yep, yep. any sport you yep. play, when you stop trying to win and you actually start to defend, you go negative. And that's exactly what I saw with Afghanistan last night, which is a real shame because they played 75% of that game absolutely brilliantly. And if they had won it, I mean, I, I, I think oh, the, the run rates are beyond me mathematically, but if they had have run it, won it scoring 290 or something and they had a bowled Australia out cheaply, would that up their run rate? What I'm trying to figure out is if they'd won that game, they would have gone to yes. five and three. How much pressure would they put on us? Well, it's still a win would still be fine for New Zealand. They were so far behind Pakistan's net run rate and New Zealand's net run rate that it wasn't funny. So right, okay. they were only ever... They had to bowl Australia out for under 170 to, to catch Pakistan. So that was that was their goal, was probably to bowl them out for under 170 to catch Pakistan. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, New if New Zealand win by one run, let's say tomorrow, let's say Sri Lanka score 250 and we get 252 in, in the 48-49 over, Pakistan would have to beat England by around about 130 runs. That's possible, isn't it? Or knock, or knock off whatever England score, or knock off whatever England score in 29-30 overs. So that's a possibility, but it's a, it's you know it's not a highly likely possibility. That's you know, that, that's where we're at with with the sort of run rate difference at the moment. Okay, Dooley is in India. He's at the airport. He's on his way, and will be there for Sri Lanka versus New Zealand. Now, Rahul was telling us yesterday that there's a seventy eight percent chance of rain and thunderstorms. You've been watching that. Has it changed at all? Then, yep, it has changed. Uh, we had, there was sort of 50% chance yesterday, 40 today, and a bit down to about 30 tomorrow. So the forecast has improved uh, throughout the day. The one thing about uh, um, angle at this time of year is you will get showers, you will get sort of not heavy, heavy downpours, but the outfield is fantastic. It does drain magnificently well. Generally, you get enough from play. Actually, if you sort of get the whole of the first innings, and then you get the showers start to come. So basically the short, the second innings is, is shortened and shortened and shortened, and you don't get 20 overs. So that that's that's the only issue when the rain sort of comes in around about that six, seven o'clock at, uh, at night time. So uh, I think we will get enough time to play at least a 20 over match. Um, and you know, I, I think it deserves a 20 over match. New Zealand probably will be desperate for a win. They haven't been at their best in the last four games and um, you know it's cost them What is the banana skin here? Sri Lanka have got nothing to play for mate Yeah that's, that's the thing um, New Zealand under pressure having to win Sri Lanka have got nothing to play for uh, Look if we play this game ten times New Zealand win it eight and, and, and that's the bottom line they have to believe that they are the better side they are the better side uh, and as I said you know, if it's played ten times we win eight of them so we've just got to make sure that one of those eight is tomorrow all right, a couple of quick questions. We'll let you go. Thank you so much, mate, for doing this in the lounge and everything else. I want to talk about two players. I want to talk about Ravindra and I want to talk about Trent Bolt. Let's start with Trent Bolt. I was talking to Telf about him. He says, I'm overreacting to it. I've been really disappointed in this guy. And I don't know whether it's because of the lack of quality cricket that he's been playing. Yes, he hasn't been taking wickets at the top. But even his fielding has been really average. I mean, he can't get his feet in the right position. I've seen him drop catches. He doesn't normally do it. How much do we need him? And, 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 and is he right on the cusp of producing his best form? Because if we go into a semi-final against India, the only way we're going to knock off that top order is him. 
yeah, he, he hasn't been at his best. Um, the ball hasn't been swinging, which I think has been disappointing for him. And and I've just the shoulders have dropped now and then. And it's not really like Trent Bolt um, to do that. So I, he's just a little bit below par. He's not the only one in the tournament that's, that sort of hasn't been able to swing the ball either. You know, Mitchell Stark has struggled at times. Shaheen has struggled at times as well. So three of the premier left armers have, have not found it easy. They've been overshone by the likes of Madhu Shankar and um, Janssen from South Africa. So he needs a performance. He needs something to boost his confidence. And, and Trent's a bit of a confidence player. Uh, and if he has an outing tomorrow that sort of is able to do that, then he will be cherry ripe if New Zealand win moving forward to that semi-final. But, um, yeah, it's not. It's never an attitude thing with Bolte. It's just a, if he feels right, if he feels comfortable. And I hope that this week has been good for him. Because, you know, without him, to be honest, we, we don't look at a very potent bowling attack. Uh, we, we made a, another error. There's been some really poor tactical decisions from this New Zealand side through the through the tournament. Um, you know, playing East Sodi the other day, and I said it before the game, this is not an after the fact, playing him in, playing in, in Bangalore on the smallest ground uh, against Pakistan was a huge mistake. Jameson coming into the squad had to play straight away. They've made some really poor errors with bowling um, first rather than batting first in two games, one against Australia, one against South Africa. So there's been some really poor stuff from the top, from, from Gary Stead down, which seriously needs to be looked at if, if New Zealand's campaign falls over. Uh, but if Bolt is back to his best, then, then they are still every chance. Is making the semi-finals finally, is that is that uh, the achievement that, that then overrides all of what you've just said. If we make the semi-finals, then yes, we've done what we set out to do. Yeah, look, I mean, I know that these guys will say that they, they came here to win it. Uh, realistically, this team is not as good as the team in, in uh, 2019. I, don't think, I think that was our chance to win a World Cup. I think this team, and obviously with Kane not having played a few games, the injuries that, that New Zealand have had, the injury to Henry makes a massive difference to the side, I think. Um, so... You know, the upside is Ratchan Ravindra uh, and one or two other performances. But I don't think this is a side that is as good or playing as well as the side we were in, in 2019. So that's sort of where I where I look at it. So a semi-final would be a great result. And once you get to a semi, yeah. you know, if it is against India, I mean, you know, if we do get to the semi, it's going to be against India. Um, they are every chance of, of, of falling over as well. I mean, they, you know, we've beaten them in semi-finals, we've beaten them in big tournaments. They are going to be under enormous, enormous pressure. So you've only got to have a day out. What's the best meal you've had so far? You're in India, mate. Tell me the best curry you've had. Oh, gosh, best curry I've had was at a place called Bukhara. Bukhara is in the ITC Moria in Delhi. Um, there's queues. You can't book a table. You basically have to stand in queue. And yes, Marty, even I have to stand in queue. Okay. I can't book a wow. table. Good uh, and you, it's basically just line up with everyone else. And um, it is first come, first serve. As soon as the table's empty, they usher people out and they usher the next lot in. So that's the best curry I've had what was um, it? on the tour. One of the best meals. Um, oh, everything. Like the dal makhani, the size of the naan bread, the, um, go on. the, the chicken, the secondary ran, which Here is like a slow-cooked um, leg of lamb. Oh, uh, it was fantastic. Geez. Everything right. everything about it. Just as soon as you see, as soon as you start talking, I'm going to have to get one tonight. I'm going to have to get one tonight now. Yeah. The other one, the other one I had, which was why and why it's one of the better meals I've had at a place called Town Hall, which is a Japanese restaurant in uh, in Delhi. And Greg Barclay, the, the head of the ICC, paid for it. So that was a very, very <laughs> one of the good, good meals. Devlin. Tomorrow! And Queen's Cock Rangers have won it! The Platform.